Excellent. So it's another lovely day in paradise. We don't have to do anything. No worries, no concerns. Just sitting down and learning how things can slow down and stop. You know, that word stop is always a very, very powerful word. I always remember that's what um, Angulimala heard from the Buddha. He was chasing after the Buddha and this assassin, sort of chasing after him, said, stop, stop, monk. And the Buddha turned around and said, I've already stopped. You stop. Of course, Angulimala was wise enough to understand the meaning of that. So he stopped. He became a fully enlightened arahat. He was a serial killer before. Then he became fully arahat. So sometimes people will say, you know, what if I've done some bad things in my past? I'm sure none of you have done as bad things as Angulimala. Are there any serial killers here today? <laughs> <laughs> Thank goodness, no. So what that means is that it's amazing just how powerful this Dhamma can be. And you can let go. You can stop. You can renounce, put things down. Even some of the very, very bad karma of what Angulimala did and still become a fully enlightened being. If he can do that, can't you? So anyhow, that just gives the sense of encouragement and trust in this path. But I know also that many times people in places like Australia, they say, well, they can see so many churches and even mosques, but they can't see where the Buddhists are and we don't have any signs that we exist. And I said, you really don't understand, do you? There are Buddhist signs, even here in Penang, at every crossroad. It's called the stop sign. So every, t <laughs> every time you come to a stop sign, always remember, ah, that reminds me of the Buddha's teachings to Angulimala. It reminds me of how I should meditate. Just stop. Stop wanting things. Stop feeling burdened by any negativity you've experienced. Just stop trying to fight sloth and torpor. Let it be so that the energy can come back to you. I wanted to talk today, or this morning, about the, uh, the hindrances again. I never really finished them yesterday. But my own experience with the hindrances, sometimes I was a monk and you start to get sleepy. And you fight that sleepiness and really put energy into your meditation. Sometimes you'd break through and you'd be awake, alive. But once I broke through sloth and torpor, I had restlessness. My mind was wandering all over the place. So I calmed my mind down. And it fell asleep again. <laughs> yeah. Can you relate to that? You know what that feels like? Yes. But I was stupid enough to do that for years. And then one day, I had to go to Bangkok to renew my visa. And we only had 12-month visa as monks in those days. And so when I went to renew my visa, I had to go there for a couple of days. And there was a place in Wat Pawan that built a new uh, little accommodation block for visiting monks. Uh, because, you know, we were at Ajahn Chah's monastery, we were allowed to stay there. And that was like a modern accommodation. The, the door, had a door which closed properly, had mosquito screens on the window. There was no bugs or, or mosquitoes or flies or ants could get in there. And they even had a mattress there to sleep on. 
To me, it was like some wonderful heavenly luxury. You could get a good night's sleep there. And even better, just a few uh, doors away, there was like a conference room. And in that conference room, there was, there was an air con, yes. I hadn't seen an air con in years. And we were allowed to get the key because we would go and meditate there early in the morning, you know, from 4 o'clock a.m. or something until arms round time. So we could sit there in a room which was air-conned, no mosquitoes, it was comfortable. And I couldn't believe just how easy the meditation was. There was no sloth and torpor. It was peaceful. And I realized that's one of the first things about sloth and torpor. Sometimes it's a natural result of just not sleeping enough or not sleeping peacefully. So in order to overcome sloth and torpor, please try and get a good night's sleep. Don't have tea or coffee just an hour before you go to bed, <laughs> or unless you're really used to it. My family in the UK, the first thing we did in the morning when we got up, have a cup of tea. The last thing we did before we went to bed, have a cup of tea. We drank more tea, I'm not sure where it all went to, because there's probably more litres of tea went into you than there were blood. I'm sure that if you took the blood of an English person, it would come out brown, not red. <laughs> but anyhow, you just got used to that, but if you're going to sort of give you too much caffeine and get awake, then please don't do it. And get a lovely sleep, and when you go to sleep, one of the best ways of falling asleep is through the awareness of the body. It's weird, but you, when you, I go through my body awareness, starting with my feet, feel my toes, I can relax them. Over the years, I've learned how to do that. Feel my toes right now, and then just know exactly what to do and what not to do in order to make them feel really relaxed. And you go from your toes to your feet, from your feet up to your ankles, going up your legs. And usually before you get to your thighs, you're fast asleep. It's a wonderful method of anybody who has trouble with sleeping, of falling asleep. It was such a wonderful method that when I went to a conference, a conference of Buddhist uh, counselors and psychotherapists and psychologists over in Sydney, this one lady said that was her job, that was her career. She started an app called sleeplikeababy.com and that's all she taught, a guided body sweeping meditation. And she made a fortune, just did the app once and then people had to pay for it and it worked. A really smart lady. So if anyone wants to do something like that in Penang, if you haven't got enough money and you want to have a nice easy job, don't call it sleeplikeababy.com, you might get sued. But you can say, what can you say? Anyway, give it a Chinese name, then they won't be able to sue you. But anyhow, it was both giving and kindness to help people deal with insomnia, and also it was a wonderful thing about Buddhism, and how Buddhism can help when people have these ordinary problems like insomnia. But anyhow, it's great to be able to use that uh, sweeping of the body, to be aware of how your body is, and how when it needs to have a rest, how to let it have a deep rest. So when you wake up in the morning, you do feel you are rested. So you don't take tiredness into the meditation. So having a good rest at night was one of the first ways of overcoming the sloth and torpor. And one of the other ways was in order to get energy, you wanted good energy, not a cup of coffee, as much as inspiration. And I've mentioned that to you before, when you can get really inspired by something, you get this natural boost of energy 
which makes it really easy to meditate. It's one of the reasons I have some of my best uh, meditations after one of Ajahn Chah's talks. They really get you, wow, this is so wonderful, so inspiring. And that energy you can very easily use at the beginning of meditation to get you really, really, really peaceful. If it's not so much like a talk from somebody, sometimes just people do a little bit of reflections on the Buddha, Dhamma, and the Sangha or something. They even do some chanting. But if you do chanting, make sure it's chanting you understand. I know that the monks, I mean, like me, we chant in Pali. I'll let you into a secret. You know why we chant in Pali? And you can't understand what we're chanting. It's because I can make a mistake and you don't notice it. <laughs> and I do do lots and lots and lots of chanting for people. There's actually somebody wanting me to do a marriage blessing on, on, the, on the 26th or something. I'm not sure how that's going to work. But nevertheless, I do recall going to give a marriage blessing for a couple, but I was really tired. I was really pushing myself and doing too much. And when I started the chanting, it was only when I was halfway through it, I realized it wasn't the marriage chant. It was the funeral chant. <laughs> I never told them. And they're still happily married. But I think it wasn't so much the words as actually my attitude of where I was coming from when I was doing the chanting. But anything which is inspiring does actually make you um, have that energy, that good energy, which you can use for meditation. So sometimes people, if you had an inspiring occurrence today, remember it and just recall it and then drop it and do the meditation and you're energized. It's like you're, you're being given like, not a Red Bull, but something much better. Do you have Red Bull in Penang? I've never had that, never. But I know some of my monks said it's very good for meditation. I said, really? <laughs> <laughs> but anyhow, that's like physical energy. You soon sort of go down. But when you have inspiration, it's a pure form of energy, and it keeps you up there so you don't get... Uh, too much sloth and torpor. But if that doesn't work, if you really do have sloth and torpor, the next thing to do is just let it be. Be kind to it. Instead of fighting it, and when you, there's so many different ways to fight it. Have you heard monks like me telling how we used to use a, a box, a matchbox, you know, a matchbox with the matches inside of it, take the cover off? and put the matchbox with all the matches in it on your head. And the reason we did that was because if you started nodding, the matchbox would fall off and the matches would scatter on the floor. It was an amazing technique. I tried that. And you know, first of all, the matches would fall on the floor, so you gather them up again, put them in the, the tray, the box, and put them on back on your, your head again. But then what happened? I stopped, the matchbox stayed on my head, it never fell off. And I thought, wow, this really works. I've overcome my sleepiness. And then someone took me aside, they said, I've been watching you, Ajahn Brahm. So, if, yes, the matchbox stays on your head, it's got no cover on it, and there's matches in it, it doesn't fall off your head. Because when you start to get sleepy, Ajahn Brahm, you're doing this. <laughs> and I've seen other people do that as well. Your body and defilements are very, very sneaky. So in the end, in the end, you don't you don't try that. And also that Zen technique of someone hitting you on the back if you get sleepy. That doesn't work these days either. Because when I was in Hong Kong a couple of years ago, I was talking with a Buddhist monk from mainland China. And he said that he was uh, on this uh, meditation retreat, a Zen retreat. And the, the teacher, the master, came down the line. There was one lady who was very, very um, sleepy. And so he hit her on the back with a Zen stick. 
You know what she did? She called the police. <laughs> it's a true story. She called the police, the police came, they had no choice, it was against the law in mainland China, and arrested the teacher, and that was the end of the retreat. <laughs> you won't, wouldn't want me to be arrested, would you, Chao Po? It would be the end of this retreat. It wouldn't be the end of the retreat, because Kai see you can take over. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, that didn't work either. So, I'm just experimenting myself how to overcome the sloth and torpor. What I did was just make peace with it, be kind to it, be gentle with it. That make peace, be kind, be gentle. Those are my translation of the second factor of the Eightfold Path. Sometimes I look at that Eightfold Path and I look at problems in meditation. Why can't more people use the Dhamma to solve the problems in meditation? Instead of matchboxes or Zen sticks. That second factor of the Eightfold Path, Samasankapa, even these days, right intention is right motivation, it's where you're coming from. Not so much where you want to get to, but where you're coming from. And it's Nekama Sankapa, it's the first of the three parts of right motivation, from, th from motivation of letting go, not attaining, but seeing how much you can abandon. And I'll just do a quick aside, because I often got take myself off course by other stories. That's exactly how Ajahn Chah taught me for years. He said, you meditate not to attain things. You meditate to let go of things. It's a beautiful teaching. What it says is the more you let go, just the more this peace, this bliss, this freedom, these jhanas, the enlightenment comes. These aren't attainments, they're the opposite of attainments. When you become free. So, it's uh, motivations of letting go, I call it motivations of making peace. Being kind. Hitting someone on the back or asking to be hit on the back as you're sleeping, that's not kindness and gentleness, the three types of right, in, right motivation, second factor of Eightfold Path. When you read that, you understand it, you understand how important it is, then you know how to deal with sloth and torpor. You make peace with it, you don't try and fight it, you don't try and destroy it. You're kind and you're gentle with it. If you can practice like that, you will find that what happens is as the minutes go past in your meditation, you've still got some mindfulness there, you still know you're sleepy or you're tired, you've got low energy. You'll notice when you don't do anything, you let it be, that the sleepiness gets less and less. Natural energy starts to build up. One of the things which happened, and I love it if this happens to you, is you know, you're bent over because that's what happens when you feel tired and you're sitting on the floor. And then your body starts to get energized and you straighten up by yourself. You don't tell the body to straighten up, it just straightens. It's nature, it's automatic. When those sorts of things happen, the first time is, wow! I never told my body to straighten up, it did it by itself, because it's got energy now. And the automatic parts of this Dharma practice starts to become very clear to you. You don't do the practice, it just happens when you get out of the way and let it happen. Let it be. And that's just one example. And so your body starts to get straight all by itself, naturally. And then the energy gets more and more, you become more mindful. The awareness is stronger, you can see more. It's like when you get up in the morning and you haven't turned the lights on yet, you don't know where things are, you may uh, 
knock over the, the water bottle in the morning. But once the lights are on, you can see everything. You don't make any mistakes. And that's what happens. Gradually, the lights in your mind get turned on, the mindfulness gets stronger. And you find you haven't got sloth and torpor. But the best thing is you haven't got restlessness either. For me, those early years when I fought uh, sloth and torpor, you go from sloth and torpor to restlessness, restlessness to sloth and torpor. You couldn't find that middle where there was awareness, light, easy, and clear. So when you practice just with sloth and torpor, first of all, being with it, letting it be, not fighting it, and having some patience, then you soon find that the sloth and torpor vanishes. And slowly, but automatically, it's replaced by the awareness. That type of clarity of mind between sloth and torpor and restlessness. You don't want to go anywhere, you just poise very clear in this moment. And again, one of the other ways of overcoming that restlessness is to value what it's like just to be clear-minded in this present moment, not wanting anything, not trying to get anywhere. But of course, that not wanting to get anywhere, not wanting to get rid of things, if you've been trying to get rid of sloth and torpor, when it does go, you still got the trying to get rid of things. It's another hindrance there, you can't be still. So I always like, when I'm sleepy, to be sleepy. And just to be with it as mindfully as you possibly can, not to fight it, and just to allow the energy to return by itself. And sometimes you have some of the best meditations when you practice that patience and that kindness. But when you are aware, for goodness sense, don't spoil it with wanting things. Sometimes, uh, as a, a little technique, when you're meditating, you can inquire just how your mind is by asking yourself this very simple question. Are you happy to be here? Right now, each one of you, are you happy to be here, right now, on this chair, in this room, on a, what day is it, a Saturday morning, or would you rather be somewhere else? If you want to be somewhere else, that is the first hindrance again, wanting, and there's also restlessness as well. And to make it very clear, Years ago, I invented one of my other stories, and I apologize if you've heard it before, but please know, any one of these stories, I've heard it more times than anybody. <laughs> <laughs> this was a story when we used to go to prisons to teach meditation. And then this is an honest, first of all, the first time I went into one of Australia's prisons to teach meditation, almost all of the prisoners came to my class. There's about 110 prisoners in this regional prison, and about 102 or 103 of them came to my class. Imagine that. I never thought that prisoners would be so spiritual. And they weren't because all they wanted to come to the meditation class for was revealed when one of these men, and he was big, with scars, he put up his hand, had only been talking for five minutes, and said, can I ask a question? When anyone that big in prison interrupts you, you always say, yes sir, yes sir, what do you want? <laughs> he was scary. Is it really true, he said, that through meditation you can learn how to fly over walls? <laughs> he actually asked that question. You know, he was in jail for a long time as a violent man, but nevertheless he became one of my really good friends in jail. Always very happy to see me and would always be very honest with me. 
And also, he said, you know that sometimes people get assaulted in jail, visitors. You know, you know, we're male, you're a male, that doesn't stop us raping you. You've got nothing to lose. And then when he said that, he looked at me, I wasn't scared. And he said, but don't worry, Ajahn Brahm. You have so many friends inside jail. If anyone tried that on you, we'd jump on them and really beat them up. <laughs> you had your supporters. And honestly, it's one of the safest places I've ever been inside a prison because you, saw, you had friendliness with each one of those prisoners. The prisoners respected you and would never ever harm you. No more than you would ever harm me. So anyhow, uh, he said that, but later on, uh, we sent one of the other monks to teach in jail. And this was the story when this monk was asked by the prisoners, can you stay a bit longer? We'll get you a cup of tea and some cheese or chocolate, or whatever you eat in the evening. We just wanted to ask, you know, to connect with you. What's it like being a monk in Australia? Even many of you don't know what it's like being a monk, but you know much more. You can go to temples, you can talk to Kaisi and other monks. But these were prisoners, they had no idea what it's like being a monk. So they said, well, what do you do? And this monk said, we get up at four o'clock in the morning. And even that shocked the prisoners. Four o'clock in the morning. Even murderers in jail don't have to get up that early. <laughs> but the monk was honest. He said, in Bodhinyana Monastery, getting up at four o'clock in the morning is optional. You can always get up earlier if you want to. <laughs> well, that's, that's the option. Okay, then what do you do at four o'clock in the morning? You know, can you watch the TV, the late night movie or something? No, we don't have TVs in Buddhist monasteries. There's not one TV in Bodhinyana Monastery. Oh, that's terrible. What do you do then? Meditate. Mm, okay. They said, you're a monk, I suppose that's what you're supposed to do. But what about your breakfast? Now when I come over here to Penang, I get a wonderful breakfast from Chao Po and from Amy and from um, Anne. But over there, we used to just get, I haven't got it here, like a cup with three Weetabix in. And that was it, every morning, same thing. I said, oh, that's really tough. Because in prison you can get pancakes, you can get noodles, you can get dumplings, you can get anything in prison. But then what do you do after breakfast? You know, can you play sport? You know, can monks play soccer? Why? Why can't monks play soccer or badminton or table tennis or something, wouldn't it be good for their health? No. Once I thought of starting a Buddhist soccer team, so we can actually play, say, the Catholics. <laughs> <laughs> and, and see who's got God on its side or whatever. So, but anyway, <laughs> A joke. <laughs> the Archbishop of Canterbury and the Pope, head of the Catholic Church, they were fed up with having all these arguments. They wanted to unite two of the main parts of Christianity in the West. So they said, let's play a round of golf. And Whoever wins, say if the Pope wins on this round of golf, if the Pope wins, the Archbishop of Canterbury has to become a Catholic. If the Archbishop wins, then the Pope has to become an Anglican. 
And we let God decide. That's what they thought. So they're playing their round of golf. And the last hole, the 18th hole, the Archbishop of Canterbury was ahead by a couple of shots. But if the Pope sank this putt, he would win and the Archbishop would have to become an Anglican. So the pressure was on the Pope. So his ball was a long way from the hole, but it was possible he could hold it. So he asked his caddy. His caddy was a nun. And that's what they do in the Catholic Church. The poor old nuns had to be caddies for the Pope. <laughs> So he asked his uh, nun, his caddy, for the putter. And he lined up the putt. And if he would sink this, he'd win by two holes, two shots. He lined it up and he prayed to his God. And then he hit the putt. Because of excitement, he hit it way too hard. He went a few feet past the hole. And because of the pressure, the excitement, even the Pope said, damn it, missed. And the nun said, no, you're holding us, you're not supposed to swear. And the nun crossed herself, never do that again. And the Pope apologized and said, look, I was just too excited, I'm sorry. And if he, he had another shot, if he hold this one, so that's why if you hold this one, he would uh, still win by one shot. So again, this was really important. So he lined it up and he hit the ball. It went right on the edge of the hole and rimmed out. He was so unlucky. And the Pope, he said he couldn't stop the excitement and he said, damn it, missed. And the nun said, your holiness, don't do that. And the God won't be happy. He said, I'm really sorry, I'm sorry to the God as well. I was just too excited. So he had one more shot. If he hold this, he would draw. If he missed it, he would lose and had to become an Anglican. That's really high pressure. <laughs> so, it's not that far, only you know, maybe six inches. He lined it up and very carefully he hit the ball. Wasn't hard enough. It stopped just a millimeter this side of the hole. He lost. And he said to himself, he couldn't help it. Damn it, missed. And before the nun could cross herself, there was a big bolt of lightning from the sky, zap, which hit the nun. And the poor nun died, electrocuted. And a big voice came from the sky, damn it, missed. <laughs> Please excuse me. <laughs> so making mistakes is normal, natural. But anyway, what did I say that joke for? <laughs> oh yeah, why monks don't, don't play sport or play golf? One of the reasons is competitive sport, yes, you may get some contact with people of other faiths, but how would a Buddhist soccer team play? Have you ever wondered why Thailand has got so many people, but they never go into World Cup soccer? They never do that well at sports. How come? Because if you were a Buddhist, you would have to play soccer according to Buddhist principles. Let go. <laughs> If the other team want the ball, let go. <laughs> Kindness, compassion, the last thing you want to do is score a goal. 
that really upsets the opposition. You can score a goal, but it has to be an own goal. <laughs> that is, that, <coughs> sorry. <coughs> that's why Thai soccer teams never do well in the World Cup. They're too Buddhist. So if Malaysia wants a good soccer team, keep the Buddhist out. <laughs> They'll be too kind. <laughs> they don't want to upset other people by winning. So <laughs> and they will never be able to do a violent tackle. You have to be compassionate and kind and gentle. So anyway, so we don't play sports. What do you do in the morning? We actually do chores. Even like the monks, we do chores. No, we clean and build and do ordinary chores. Even I do that. I used to love building. I built many of those uh, buildings over at Bodhinyana Monastery in China Grove. But recently, well, two or three years ago now, I was um, helping uh, fix up a leak in the plumbing at our retreat center. I had to go on the roof climb on the roof, on the, uh, the roof, to actually to access the pipes. And someone saw me and took a photograph of me on the roof. And the committee from that day on, they banned me from getting up on the roof. Number one, I'm too heavy. They didn't know if the, <laughs> if the roof would hold. They said, no, we want you as a teacher. We don't want you to be injured. So they banned me from going on roofs. I couldn't do any work. Every now and again, I can, a concrete truck comes and get the concrete in a wheelbarrow and help push it along. And I know I'm a 72-year-old monk. I, can, I still love helping out whatever you can do. So that's what we do in the morning. We do physical work. It's good for you. Then we have our lunch. And I told you what we have for our lunch. Over in Australia, we have the arms bowl, and everything goes in the bowl. And that's why you have these amazing combinations. I remember having spaghetti bolognese with strawberry ice cream on top. <laughs> because, you know, when you have it in the bowl, you've only got a certain area, and sometimes it goes in the wrong place. <laughs> So, and they said, that's disgusting. Even apparently in jail, when you're in solitary confinement, they still give you a tray, you know, the, the savouries on this side, the, the sweets, the fruit, the desserts on another side. They don't even mix it up for people who've done terrible crimes. What have you monks been up to? <laughs> so what about in the afternoon? What do you do in the afternoon, monks? So we don't watch any videos. Can you play games? You can't do sports. Poker. <laughs> Monks don't play poker. Although there was a story about that. Here comes another joke. <laughs> that in this city, the, the monk, the rabbi, and the Christian priest decided to you know, try and get some harmony together and understand each other. They started just by having like after, afternoon tea and that didn't really work and there was, wasn't anything which was really challenging. Then they had discussions and then they decided let's to play some kind of sports to test each other out. And eventually they started playing cards and they had a little poker club, the rabbi, the monk and the priest. When they started this poker club, first of all, it was just for you know, nothing. But then they started for money, makes it more exciting. They were gambling. And someone heard about that, and the police arrested them. Because gambling was illegal. So they had to go to court in front of a judge. You know, the, the priest, the rabbi, and the monk. They were charged with the illegal act of gambling. Very embarrassing. And when the, when the judge saw these three kind of holy men, he said, well, let's not waste time. You, the priest, first of all, 
Where are you gambling? And the priest, so incredibly fast, looked up to the sky and down again. And when he looked up, he actually said, please, Jesus, forgive me. But no one could hear that. So he said, no, I wasn't gambling. So the judge said, okay, off you go. And then there was a rabbi. And the rabbi, were you gambling? And this time the rabbi, I mean, some of you may have heard this because you're educated, you went to a school in UK or something. Sometimes people would put their hands behind their backs and cross their fingers. And that's what the rabbi did. He said, no, I wasn't gambling. Okay, off you go. That's supposed to absolve you from any bad karma, from lying. But don't do that. I know that. So when you come for your interviews, if I see you put your hand behind the back, I know what you're up to. And then it was a monk's time before the judge. And the judge asked the monk, he's getting a bit suspicious this time, and you can't look up to the sky and say, Buddha, forgive me, that's not part of Buddhism. You can't cross your hands behind your back, put your hands in front of you, monk. Were you gambling? And the monk has none of these you know, dodgy tricks, he would just use his wisdom. Was I gambling, your honour, he replied to the judge. With whom? <laughs> <laughs> okay, off you go. <laughs> so we, we, don't, we don't do any gambling. So we just meditate or exercise. What about dinner? What time do you have dinner in monastery? You don't have dinner, you all know that. Isn't it really strange? I've been keeping this not eating in the afternoon, evening, at night time rule for 49 years. How come I'm so fat? <laughs> <laughs> and Chao Po, do I eat a lot? <laughs> I don't think I eat a lot. But, but still, it must be a big heart. It can't be fat. <laughs> so there, we don't have any dinner, maybe a cup of tea, that's all. And, but what do you do in the evening then? More meditation. Okay, said the prisoner, what time do you go to bed? Bed? Some of you have been to my cave, I don't have a bed in my cave. I have a mattress on the floor. We live quite simply. You know, coming over here, you see whatever you know, people give you to sleep on. So I've got a bed where I've been sleeping on the last few nights. But it's always very scary sleeping in a bed. You know why? You might fall out. <laughs> when you're on the floor, you can roll around. You never fall out of bed when you're on the ground. So anyway, they said, wow, that's so austere in your monastery. That's so harsh. It's much harsher than being in prison. Why do you do that for? And one of those prisoners liked this monk, and he couldn't stop himself saying, that's so bad in your monastery, why don't you come in here and stay with us instead? <laughs> that was the time he was invited to stay in jail. They had a point. If for some reason I do something wrong, I don't do anything wrong anyway, but if I did something wrong and was put in jail unfairly, I would be like a retreat for me. I could get in solitary confinement, no one would bother me, I'd have a much more comfortable bed than I have in my monastery, I have cho much bigger choice of food, and I wouldn't have to do a thing. So why is it that jails, is, in Australia anyway, are much more comfortable than monasteries? Why is it in prisons people always want to leave? In monasteries, as you know, there's a waiting list of people trying to get in. Why? 
what is a jail, what is prison? And when I heard that, you got the insight that a prison is any place that you don't want to be. If you're in a job you hate, going to work every Monday morning, you just really get unhappy and tense because your job is like a prison. If you're in a relationship with a partner you just don't like and having great difficulty, your relationship is like a prison. And if you're in a meditation retreat where you're getting bored and frustrated, you don't like being here, then this room becomes a prison for you. If you're in a body which is causing you pain, then your body is a prison. How do you escape from the many prisons of life? You don't need to change your partner. You don't need to get some magic medicine so you don't feel any aches and pains or sickness. You don't need to change your job, change your attitude. Want to be here. If you're in this room and you change your attitude to want to be in this moment, want to be with this sleepy mind, want to be with this restless mind, want to be here, then you find all the restlessness goes. Peace comes, contentment. You are happy to be here. You don't understand how powerful that simile is. Every time I'm restless, it's because I don't want to be here. I want to be somewhere else. I want to be in China. I don't want to be with limiters. <laughs> it's crazy. I've seen some people, they've been on a retreat and they come, oh, how was it? And they said, terrible. Why? Well, I could only get into second China. I just couldn't get into third. That's absolute craziness. Any of the jhanas is more than happy. So when you want to be here, then you become still. When you become still, you become energized. When you become energized, you become blissed out. Simple as that. So if ever you're meditating and saying, I don't want to be here, I want to be somewhere else, that's a problem. When you're meditating, you start to see colors and think this is nimittas, which it probably is. Fine, but then you want the nimittas to be stable. And that's why they keep moving, because you want them to be still. It's the wanting is the problem. Or you just, uh, you have nimittas and having a wonderful time, but I want to be deep, I want your jhanas. Or you get jhanas, I don't want, oh yeah, jhanas are nice, but I want to be enlightened. And then you get enlightened, well enlightenment is nice, but then I want psychic powers. Actually, you can't say that. When you're in light, you don't want anything. But anyhow, what do you want? There was a nice description of what enlightenment is. Would you like to be enlightened? Fully enlightened? You would. What is it? What type of happiness? A lot of times people say, yes, I would like to be enlightened, but they haven't got a clue what it is. I always say that's like getting on a bus, not knowing where the bus is going. <laughs> so anyway, I will tell you what enlightenment is. If you haven't heard this story before, there was a kid, uh, five children. And the five children were playing what we call the wishing game. And the wishing game's rules is this. Every child had a wish, and the one who came up with the best wish would win the wishing game. So the first boy said, if I had a wish, I would wish for a new computer game. Because you love playing computer games. Okay, that's your wish. What's the second wish? The second wish was done by a girl, 
And she said, yeah, I can get a new computer game. But then, after one month or two months, I get bored of it. So I wish for a computer game shop. If I own the store, I can get the latest computer game whenever it comes out, because I own the shop. That's obviously superior. Then they asked the third child, the boy, what would you like? And the third boy said, well, I love computer games too, but my mummy and daddy won't let me play computer games. They say I should do my homework first of all. And the homework goes on and on and on and on. Well, I want to play computer games. So my solution is this. If I had a wish, I would wish for $10 billion, not ring it, US dollars. So with 10 billion US dollars, I can buy my own uh, computer store. And then I will buy my own school. If I own the school and pay the teachers and the headmaster, if the teachers give me any homework, if they mark me and give me poor scores for the homework I didn't do anyway, I will give them the sack. I own a school. So that way, if I own the school, I can always do as many computer games as I want and still get the best marks in the school which I own. And once I graduate from my own school, then I'll buy my own university. You know, people do own universities. And because I own the university, I can again give myself honorary degrees. First an honorary bachelor's in whatever I want, and then an honorary PhD in whatever I want. And when I tell that story, I always make sure that Ajahn Bhumadi doesn't hear me because he's now got an honorary PhD. <laughs> but he doesn't own the school. <laughs> but, here we go. So, that way, with you know, $10 billion US, I can't spend that in my life. I'd always have something else to buy whenever I need it. And that way I can play computer games as much as I want. Is that a better wish so far? So there's two more people to come yet. And just like the story of the, the priest, the rabbi and the monk, the last person is always wins the prize. So the fourth person, a girl, said, I can do better than that. If I had a wish, she said, I'd wish for three wishes. That's a wish. For my first wish, I'd have the, 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 uh, the uh, what's it called, the computer game shop. For my second wish, I'll have the billion dollars, ten billion dollars US. And for my third wish, I would have three more wishes. <laughs> that way I can go on forever beat that. There was a wish of an infinity of wishes granted. And the fifth boy beat that very easily. If you haven't heard that story before, have a think, what could be much better than an infinity of wishes granted? That fifth boy, he had a bald head and a brown robe. And he said, if I had a wish, I wish I was so content I never needed a wish ever again. The fourth kid was someone who had the freedom of desires, wealth and power, so you can get whatever you want. The fifth kid had the freedom from desires. The freedom from desires is called peace, enlightenment. Fifth kid was the Buddha. I wish I was so content, I never needed any wishes ever again. The freedom from desires never the freedom of desires. 
And when you get some nice meditation happening, you can spend like a half an hour, an hour or many hours and not one wish, not one desire comes into your head. You can feel what it's like to have the freedom from desires. Totally at peace, content, satisfied. And if somebody came to you and said, you're a good meditator, I'm here to give you whatever you want. What would you like? And you just say nothing. You're content, rested, free. So that gives you an idea why it is the wanting which is the main hindrance. What is wanting called? In Pali, it's got two names. One of them is called Kamachanda. That's the first of the five hindrances. But it's also called Loke Abhija. That's how it is termed in the Anguttara Nikaya. It's a synonym. When I first read those suttas and Vinaya in Pali, that kind of shocked me because I'd seen this word loke abhija many times before in the Satipatthana. It's called uh, covetousness for the world. I never understood what that word meant until I saw it was just a synonym for the first hindrance. And the other word in the Satipatthana Sutta, Dhammanasa, usually called grief for the world. This is a really silly translation. In the commentaries, in the Anguttara, it always means the second hindrance. So in order to do even the Satipatthana insight practices, you're supposed to have already weakened weaken immensely those first two hindrances and by extension the other three as well. That's what the five, uh, five hindrances mean. It's part of the Satipatthana Sutta, it's part of the uh, Samatha practice, it's part of the arising of wisdom. The five hindrances are like the enemies of wisdom, the enemies of peace. And once you see what they really are, you understand that you need to be still. You need to not indulge in ill will. You need to just allow the sloth and torp to vanish and the restlessness to vanish. And then the last of those hindrances, the lack of doubt. And that is one of the most difficult hindrances to explain. For most of my monastic life, I couldn't really get a good um, handle on what that, that doubt, the fifth hindrance was, until that so many years, I mentioned to you last night about the experience of what's my earliest memory and getting a, a, the memory of being a, a baby in my pram. And one of the things which always came with that memory was a certainty that that was real. It was you know, the total lack of doubt. And I was trained as a scientist, I was trained to doubt, not to trust everything. But in this memory, it was strange and I knew that was me. I knew that was my mother. I knew that was my grandma. I knew that was Porky the pig. And I could never really investigate or contemplated why. It was because that in order to get those past life memories, you had to have a deep meditation. And the deep meditation afterwards is where the five hindrances are subdued and don't return for a long time. What I was doing was realizing that those five hindrances, including doubt, had totally disappeared for a while. And there was a certainty in what you were remembering as being 100% reliable. Just as I look at you now, and I realize that is Kaisi. You haven't been photoshopped. 
in some video, you're not a hologram of Kaisi, you really are Kaisi. There's no doubt at all. But even this is not as clear as when your five hindrances have been removed. And you know even more certainly that what you're seeing, what you're hearing, what you're smelling, tasting, touching, or you know it is reliable. Now when that happens, other people can argue with you and say, no, that's not Kaisi, it was you know, his identical twin. Do you know people who look identical? There was this Buddhist, he was from Ireland, who was with me over in uh, Australia for many years, and he had an identical twin. This was over in Ireland you know, many years ago, maybe 60, 70 years ago. And then no one could tell them apart. And they exploited that. That sometimes only one of them would go to school. And the teacher would say, you know, that one of you wasn't at school yesterday. Which one was it? And they said, that's your job to find out, sir. <laughs> And the teacher couldn't punish one of them because if he punished the wrong one, he gets sued and put in jail. And they really exploited that. They didn't learn very much. They had a wonderful time. They took turns of not going to school. And no one knew which one it was. Do you have identical twins here in Perth, in, um, in Penang? Any of you? Are you really Kaisi? Have you got like identical twin? <laughs> and one <laughs> non identical twin. Have you got a twin? Oh, I never knew that. But not identical, Are you sure? Oh sister, okay, fair enough. <laughs> it's an identical twin. One of you can ordain and one of you can stay home. And you can swap. <laughs> no, you can't do that. <laughs> <laughs> but any, anyhow, the, the doubt is when you're 100% sure. And it's, it's strange, it's not you're deceiving yourself, it's something which is inherent in a, a mind which has just come out of deep meditation. It's clarity, is like something else. So when we talk about that fifth hindrance of doubt, it always is understood only when you just emerge from a deep meditation. Which is why those deep meditations are really important if you want to become enlightened. What you see is reliable. Okay, that's the five hindrance talk and a few stories and a few silly jokes as well, like the priest and the, uh, the rabbi and the monk and the Pope and the Archbishop of Canterbury having a, a match of golf to see which one was the superior religion. And a few other little stories just to make the main part of this, today's talk about what the five hindrances are and how they're overcome. Very clear. And lastly, about what is enlightenment. So content. You don't want anything else. You're free from desires, not a prisoner of them. Okay, so thank you for listening. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. <laughs>